You know, it's very odd coming to Stanford and giving this talk. I want to thank Stanley and Robson for having me here. Uh, and the reason I say it's odd is because this is really the epicenter of sleep surgery of the laryngologist. So I feel like I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle a little bit. So um, here's my disclosures. There's a lot of research and a lot of interest in sleep going on right now, and we're all involved in it. And the reason we're involved in it is we're, we're really trying to push this along and make things better for uh, patients in the future. So why do, why do we care? Why do we care about OSA? Well, certainly there's untreated, uh, uh, untreated OSA leads to increased mortality. And you can see that it's really mainly true for the severe obstructive sleep apneics, but also true to some degree for mild and moderate uh, level of disorder. And another reason we care is that CPAP, which is considered the gold standard therapy, really is a very efficacious therapy, but not very effective. And it's not very effective because people don't wear it. You know, it's been various studies have showed 46 to 83 percent of patients wear their CPAP for less than four hours a night. And that leaves a lot of people with undertreated obstructive sleep apnea, in some cases very dangerous obstructive sleep apnea. OSA is a dilemma for us as surgeons, though, and the reason is that in a given day, you, you'll see a wide variety of patients who differ vastly <coughs> in their uh, problems. So this is a 20-year-old with Down syndrome sent to me. You can see she has a tracheotomy. They wanted to get the trach out, and I was the one that they were hoping to get the trach out. This is a 60-year-old who just comes in with uh, loud snoring, just wanted his snoring treatment, but he does have mild to moderate sleep apnea. So how do I treat uh, these people? So... And the reason is sleep surgery is tough is that there is a multi-level uh, degree of airway collapse. There's interaction between these anatomical sites. And there's multi-factor etiology of OSA. There's, we're learning more and more about sleep stability. And this is still a, uh, something that I'm still trying to wrap my head around. But, you know, um, not having stable breathing during sleep actually causes changes in CO2 levels, which can induce apneas, both central and obstructive. There's passive airway collapsibility. That uh, can be changes over our lifespan and the stiffness and elasticity of the lining of the throat. There's the neuromuscular component uh, that creates active airway dilation. There's soft tissue hypertrophy uh, created by obesity, fat neck, large tongue, hypertrophy tonsils. And then there's the craniofacial structure. You know, having a small box can actually contribute to this. So we need to individualize the treatment plan based on which factors we think are involved. So our question is always, what surgical approach will maximize outcome in a given OSA patient? And in order to answer this, we don't have all the answers now. We need larger perspective sleep surgery studies. We need large numbers of patients using multi-center. And we need to record validated factors or variables acquired during <coughs> routine patient care. And this is a group of factors that we came up with at the International Sleep Surgery Society Research Forum, and these are things that we typically get during the course of patient care, but we need to record them in prospective fashion, and we need to, unfortunately, EPIC was not designed for research, if you guys haven't figured that out yet. It was designed for uh, something else, but, you know, we do need to record what we do and, and then re-record our results and compare over time uh, what our outcome is. So what is our phenotype? A phenotype is a composite of organisms, observable characteristics or traits. It includes morphology and behavior. And it's determined by expression of our genetic code in interaction with external environmental influences. This is the Peabody Library at Hopkins. It's one of my favorite places to go. You can see it's a really beautiful place. Um, the way I explain phenotype to my patients, I go, you know, your genes are your library. You have an entire library of uh, genes. But the things that are getting read and getting checked out are, are really your phenotype. That's what's going to determine the activity and change uh, in you is what's being read in your genetic code. So, you know, phenotype can be wrong. Um, this is, I've been accused many times over the years of being George Stephanopoulos. And you can see that there might be some closeness to it, but he has much better hair dye capability than I do. So, and you can see that it can be close but wrong. And phenotype also has a certain scientific hazard. I can see that you all actually have a phrenology skull over there in the corner, which, uh, you know, we can actually, in science, often uh, steer ourselves wrong by measuring the wrong things. And uh, so this was a 
uh, important science, uh, uh, science back in the mid-1800s, looking at bumps on the skull to see if you could figure out things about people's moral character and uh, ability, whether or not they're going to become mad, as Marlowe saw in The Heart of Darkness. There's also a moral hazard to decision-making based on physical characteristics. So uh, this is the National um, Peace and Justice Memorial in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. So if you ever have a chance to see this, it's, it's really heart-rending. There's a hanging column for every county in the United States where a lynching occurred. And on that column are the names of the people who were lynched. And I hate to say there's hundreds of these columns. So certainly we have the scientific hazard, we have moral hazard of making decisions based on physical characteristics. However, we've been doing it for quite a while in sleep surgery already. And one of the first kind of successful demonstrations of this was Michael Freeman's paper on clinical predictors of obstructive sleep apnea based on fairly straightforward paradigm looking at tongue position, tonsil size, and body mass index. And based on these three characteristics alone, there's a lot of predictive ability of who's going to respond to palatal surgery. Certainly large tonsils, normal tongue, 80% cure rate with soft palate surgery alone. Normal tonsils, normal tongue, 40% cure rate, and uh, normal tonsils, large tongue, it could be as low as 8% cure rate with soft palate surgery alone. So this was actually, this is something I still use and I think most sleep surgeons use. If we see three or four plus tonsils, just get the tonsils out. You're going to make a huge difference, even if the person's going to need some CPAP. When the, you've got to remember that 30% of the night, 40% of the night, your average person's not wearing their CPAP. You can do them a big favor by getting those tonsils out. So, what are the phenotyping tools at, at our disposal? Well, certainly history, physical exam, our sleep study, certain imaging, and perhaps drug-induced sleep endoscopy, which I'll go into a little bit more fully. So on history, uh, I spent a lot more time recently thinking about insomnia. And the reason I do that is insomnia can be a real problem, uh, both for people who are trying to learn how to use CPAP, but also for non-CPAP alternatives. Uh, one of the most common ones now is upper airway stimulation. We do know that people with insomnia have uh, issues with that. Ask about respiratory instability. I mean, that certainly is often associated with insomnia, frequent waking and gasping, poor sleep quality, light sleep, and certainly nasal uh, complaints. On physical examination, I'm looking for things that would be less favorable for UPP, such as BMI. We know that greater than 32 is associated with worse outcome. Neck girth, 17 inches in male, 16 in female modified malin potty scores of three or four, jaw size, looking at high arch maxilla, retronathia, misalignment. This makes me not want to operate on people. I know that here you guys love these guys and do all this fancy jaw surgery, which is awesome, and uh, I wish that uh, we had better training in that uh, across the country. And certainly smaller tonsils, less favorable. On PSG, you can get some hints. Uh, you know, if the supine to lateral ratio is two to one, you might think there's some tongue compression. If it if your ratio of AHI goes up during REM sleep, it's likely due to neuromuscular collapsibility. And certainly imaging to look at jaw, jaw abnormalities. So, you know, when I try to categorize patients uh, in their non-PAP treatment selection, I think, does this patient have too much tissue? And if they do, I'm thinking a tissue reductive surgery such as UPP, partial glossectomy. Certainly weight loss or bariatrics play important roles. So these are your more obese patients, which I have a lot of, unfortunately, in Memphis. Acquired macroglossia, these are the people with very large tongues, often with teeth indentations on the lateral tongue or adenotonsil or hypertrophy, including lingual tonsils. Or is the box too small? Do they have a small compressed craniofacial structure? And that can be addressed with MMA or maxillary distraction. Usually these patients have normal uh, BMI. They have what I call relative macroglossia. It looks like a, a large tongue, but it's really just a small jaw. Narrow mandibular arch, high arch palate malocclusion, retronathia, open or cross bite? Or is their tissue too lax? Do they have poor neuromuscular tone? This is a group that we think about in spire therapy. Or do they have increased collapsibility? Do they just need tissue stiffening or repositioning, such as high myotomy, suspension, or radiofrequency? Often these are normal weight people, normal tongues. They have these issues on supine sleep and REM sleep with increased HI. So, Let's talk a few minutes just about uh, drug-induced sleep endoscopy and its potential role. So uh, awake endoscopy is something that we typically do. It's actually part of the 
paradigm for evaluating your patient who comes to you with sleep disorder breathing. It's certainly easy to perform. It's easy to do in the office, relatively cost effective. You can identify inflammatory issues that need treatment as part of your medical management, such as allergy, polyps, laryngopharyngeal reflux. And you may identify narrowing from tissue hypertrophy, such as adenoid, palatine tonsil, pharyngeal wall squeeze, lingual tonsils, or tongue-based hypertrophy. Unfortunately, it has poor predictive power with regards to sleep surgery outcomes, and that's the reason why we've been introducing more drug-induced sleep endoscopy. And again, drug-induced sleep endoscopy is easy to perform. However, it is more costly. It requires either OR or bronchoscopy suite. You do visualize all three levels of the airway, nasal or pharynx, hyperpharynx. You can correlate this real-time with proximity data. It is safe, and it does allow evaluation of classical sites in patients without tissue hypertrophy. So this is the group of people I use it on. If I see tissue hypertrophy, often I won't do sleep endoscopy, but if they have a normal appearing airway on a wake endoscopy, I find that drug-induced sleep endoscopy is going to give me more information. So it allows you to characterize the collapse pattern during snoring and apneas. The vote system has been a popular way of grading uh, dice. It's certainly easy to do. I don't know if you guys use a more elaborate uh, grading system here. It's the one I still use. It kind of tells you the site, the velopharynx, oropharynx, tongue, or epiglottis, the degree of collapse, whether non, partial, or complete, and the pattern of collapse, AP, lateral, or concentric. So, but the problem is, are these findings any better at predicting than awake endoscopy at predicting surgical outcomes? So, well, let's look at drug-induced sleep endoscopy's effect on sleep surgery decisions. Well, I don't need to tell you much about this. You guys already know this. You've written the paper on it. But this is a good paper that came out not too long ago, uh, a meta-analysis of eight studies by Dr. Capasso and the group here comparing awake endoscopy to DICE. And they found that treatment decision changed uh, after DICE 50% of the time. So it certainly was affecting the way surgeons thought about uh, treating the airway. And this decision change was most likely related to how to treat the hypopharynx and larynx. However, there was no evidence in any of these studies that it resulted in better outcomes for the patient. In the early studies of using DICE for INSPIRE, there was an observation that certain patients have this more AP palatal collapse, whereas certain people have this circumferential palatal collapse. And in this early pilot data, they found that the patients with a complete uh, concentric collapse, only based on three patients here, um, actually did quite well with INSPIRE, going from an AHI of 25 down to 6. However, those five patients with complete circumferential collapse really did not benefit from the INSPIRE therapy. So based on this, as part of their um, standard protocol, they introduced DICE looking specifically for the presence of circumferential collapse at the level of the soft palate. This is a little study we did. Uh, uh, this is unpublished data from the um, STAR trial, but looking at the Muller maneuver compared to uh, DICE in patients with complete concentric collapse, they found that actually Muller maneuver overpredicted collapse in people without concentric collapse, whereas many of the patients with concentric collapse had normal Muller maneuver. So I just showed you that DICE was better than Mullen Maneuver at predicting concentric collapse. This was a study that we have ongoing at uh, UT where we're ac actually looking at pediatric patients with severe OSA. So these are children who have uh, very bad OSA to begin with, often AHI is greater than 15, and DICE was performed at the time of initial surgical intervention. So typically with uh, pediatric patients, the uh, gold standards adenotonsillectomy However, we do know that there, in patients with severe sleep apnea in children, there's going to be a high rate of ongoing sleep apnea. So we're wondering if, you know, DICE would allow us to get better outcomes. And we did show that 57% of uh, these patients had velopharyngeal collapse, 48% had tongue-based collapse, and 21% superglottic collapse. And we actually added additional surgeries based on DICE at the time of adenotonsillectomy. We've got pretty good outcomes. Most of these patients were able to get down to mild to moderate uh, sleep apnea. But we really need to do this in randomized fashion, randomize patients to either just TNA alone or TNA plus DICE-related surgeries to see if we get better outcomes. So how about drug-induced sleep endoscopy's effect on non-CPAP-related treatments? Well, we do know that DICE helps oral appliance outcomes. So this was a 
a case control study of 20 patients who, were, who had dice prior to placement of oral appliance or 20 patients who had oral appliance prior to dice. And they found that there, you know, there's no difference in the groups based on <coughs> age, BMI, HI, or oxygenadir. But they found that patients who had dice beforehand had significantly lower AHIs with oral appliance therapy, and significantly more patients were cured 45% versus 15% if they had had uh, a dice. So dice can actually help you with your oral appliance, help you figure out, you know, the positioning of the jaw to optimize sleep-related outcomes. Um, here's uh, another study that actually looked at patients who uh, underwent dice before sleep surgery. So this was a study of 40 patients who underwent UPP and 64 who underwent dice, UPP plus hypopharyngeal surgery based on the findings of dice. And this was interesting. They found that the mean HI reduction um, in the UPP only group versus the UPP dice group was not significant. However, they found that the complication rate for the dice group was 35% versus 3% for the UPP only group. So the question that this raises, does, is dice just making us do more procedures that don't really help our outcome? And I think that's, that's the question that we have to ask. So this study did have some flaws in that the UPP only group was retrospective, whereas the UPP dice group was prospective. So whenever you have a prospective trial, you're going to be more sensitive to complications. You're going to pick up more complications in a retrospective study. So that was a confounding variable. This was a, a study uh, Dr. Gazarian uh, did. Uh, you can see that he had multiple contributors, including myself and the group here at Stanford. But it was a retrospective study of sleep surgery outcomes of 275 patients who underwent preoperative dice at 14 centers across the United States. There's moderate degree of inter inter agreement on dice readings. We actually sent our dice exams to a central place that was read and compared to our findings. 41% of patients demonstrated surgical response rate, so that's an AHI of let, a drop of greater than 50% and overall AHI of less than 50, 15%. And they found that collapse of the lateral wall of the oropharynx or a complete tongue-based collapse was associated with poor surgical response. So, you know, this study didn't really show that DICE actually improved our surgical outcomes but it did show that there are certain groups that are associated with poor surgical outcomes, and that's the lateral wall of the oropharynx or a complete tongue-based collapse. This was an international study of DICE, uh, comparing centers that perform DICE routinely to those who don't, and it was a retrospective study of 326 patients at seven international sites. 170 patients underwent DICE, 156 patients had no DICE, they found that the DICE group had a 48% AHI decrease versus 60% AHI decrease for the no DICE group, which was significant. However, this study also had some problems. I actually reviewed this study. I was one of the reviewers. Um, I thought it was good enough to get out there, but it did have some major flaws, one being that they failed to control for different outcomes among study sites, procedural differences among study sites, and the reasons for DICE among <coughs> study sites. So some some of these sites were probably only performing in dice and people they thought had more severe sleep apnea. So how about dice and upper airway stimulation outcomes? Well, this is where dice is probably helpful, okay? So we know that upper airway stimulation works in properly selected patients. And the properly selected patient is one who has the dice profile that we're choosing. So this is the STAR profile, a STAR trial patient group. Uh, they had a mean AHI of 29 at the start of the study. At five years out, mean AHI reduced to 6.2. Pretty good results, better than most of what we can achieve with soft tissue surgery alone. Also, improvements in the Epworth sleepiness scale that's normalized at 60 months. Also, close to normalization of snoring levels in the majority of patients at 60 months. This is follow-up uh, research. This is a, um, a group of American and European centers. This is after a post-approval study of a group of patients who underwent um, upper airway stimulation with a mean AHI of 36 going down to 10 um, and normalization of the upper sleepiness scale score. So again, we know that we're getting good results with upper airway stimulation, but we're choosing these patients based on DICE, and DICE must have a positive impact on that. This is just a group of patients I looked at. I have a prospective study of my own going on, and most of the patients I'm doing dice on, I'm doing it 
for a reason, either someone who I can't see the reason why they have sleep apnea or they're being actively evaluated for upper airway stimulation. But you can see that if I'm just looking at my vote scores, my vote scores are worse in my DICE group than my awake endoscopy. So that tells me that you are picking up more on collapsible sites when you do DICE, and that is significant. However, when I compare my sleep surgery outcomes, this is just a small study, but it's, it's ongoing. This is just some preliminary results to my non-DICE groups, really not seeing any significant <coughs> difference in, uh, in outcomes as far as uh, sleep surgery outcomes. So, is DICE reliable and repetitive? So this was a, a study of whether DICE was reliable in determining candidacy for upper airway stimulation therapy. And uh, what we did is we took 64 DICE-related videos from the STAR trial, and we had expert viewers review these. Ten of these were judged to have had complete concentric collapse and 54 without. And we had uh, multiple uh, experts look at these and, and grade them. So what we found was that the experts, five out of five experts, agreed 66% of the time. Uh, there was four out of five agreeing 12% of the time. So I consider 78% of the time experts, you know, have pretty good agreement. But there were cases where there was a disagreement. So this does show you kind of the limitation of DICE. And I'm going to kind of, I'll just show you a few examples. So this is the kind of stuff you're looking at at sleep endoscopy, especially if you're judging a patient for candidacy for um, INSPIRE, you know, is this AP collapse or is this circumferential collapse? And it's not always straightforward. Um, there are certain things that I look for. So I'm looking for an oblong airway. If I see an oblong airway and not a circular airway, that's better. I'm also paying close attention to movement of the posterior wall and lateral wall. Obviously, that's an apnea right there. Um, but if I'm seeing a more oblong airway and very little motion in the posterior or lateral wall, uh, I think it's mainly going to be AP collapse, OK? I'm just going to walk through these. So what's, the, what's our feeling on DICE? Well, DICE may improve the effectiveness of oral appliance fitting. However, it may not help improve outcomes of soft tissue upper airway surgery over awake examination alone. I think the results of upper airway stimulation outcomes validate the use of DICE for screening for this role of surgery. It may have a role in the initial surgery selection for severe pediatric OSA, but it remains a subjective evaluation with expected disagreement at 20 to 25 percent of cases. And therefore, I think we do need continued research and other more precise methods, which I think probably you guys here at Stanford are doing. You've got so many smart engineers and things around here. I hope that we see more roles for things like sleep MRI or other modalities in the future uh, that can tell us a little bit more. So sleep disorder breathing in older adults is a particular interest of mine, and I'm going to get into this a little bit more. This is just a... Uh, diagram that I just made up. Okay, so this has no real data behind it, but this is just based on my observation that we really have a couple of different um, kind of bimodal distribution in the onset of obstructive sleep apnea. We, we see these people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, but we also see a group that never had it and start to get in the <coughs> 60s and 70s. I'm 52 and I'm starting to have it, so I'm very aware of this right now. And this group, I think, is different than this group. And that's one of the things that we're looking at in my uh, prospective study. And these are some of the observations. So this is still being, being validated in this ongoing study I have. But generally, uh, OSA prevalence is much less in the younger 50 uh, group, whereas it becomes very prevalent in the group greater than 50. OSA severity is worse in this younger group and less severe in this older group in general. This is male predominant in the younger group. It's more equal postmenopausal in women. BMI is certainly larger in this younger cohort, smaller in this older cohort. Neck circumference goes along with that, larger, smaller. Tonsil size, larger, smaller. Yep. OSA effects are different. So you get much more cardiovascular morbidity, and certainly quality of life effect in this younger group, whereas the quality of life becomes predominant in this older group. Tissue-related effects, craniofacial effects are very much a cause in this younger group. 
but we're seeing more tissue collapsibility and neuromuscular effects in this older cohort. So what do we know about sleep disorder breathing in older adults? Well, it's very prevalent. If you look at people greater than 65, our senior citizens, 62% will have AHI greater than 10, 44% have AHIs greater than uh, 20, and 24% have AHIs greater than 40. So extremely prevalent. Can we treat all these people? Do we need to treat all these people? I think that's really the appropriate question. Postmenopausal women have 3.5 times the risk of AHI greater than 15 than premenopausal women. So there is a hormonal factor involved with this. And then we have loss of neuromuscular tone associated with physiologic aging. We know that. So this affects the throat as well. So this is an interesting study looking at the collapsibility of the airway in a 75-year-old compared to a 20-year-old using negative pressure. And they found that it takes a lot less negative pressure to collapse the airway of a 75-year-old than a 20-year-old. You can see that the, the pressure drop had to drop down to, to close the airway down to around 20 centimeters of water versus only about five for the average 75-year-old. So also we know that there's reduced neuromuscular tone. There's slower reaction times in our main airway dilator, the genia glossus, in older, uh, even older awake adults. Uh, so, and that's worsened in older adults with OSA. So we have less uh, reaction time in our genia glossus dilator. So what do we know? So we know that there's increased mortality of OSA only in the younger cohort. We're not seeing it, and it's in the younger cohort that has severe sleep apnea. The mortality rates of older patients with sleep disorder breathing really equal the mortality rates of those without sleep disorder breathing. Snoring witness apneas, excessive daytime sleepiness are not associated with cardiovascular disease in patients greater than 65. Sleep disorder breathing is not associated with blood pressure changes in adults greater than 60, unlike younger adults where that association is strong. However, this is the caveat. There is increased risk of stroke in older patients who have sleep hypoxemia. So maybe HI is less important in the older folks in sleep hypoxemia. And by definition, that's greater than 10% of sleep time with O2 sat less than 90% because that's the group that's going to suffer the strokes. Why is this the case? Well, we know that younger patients with sleep disorder breathing have increased CO2 responsiveness, and this creates a strong ventilatory uh, control response. They have higher <coughs> leak gain. So test this on your children while they're asleep. Go pinch their nose, and you'll see they actually have a violent response to try to breathe after an induced apnea. So that's what happens in younger people. They get greater pressure strength swings in the intrathoracic space, heart rate changes, unstable breather patterns, and catecholamine release. Whereas in older people, you have predominance or airway collapsibility and neuromuscular decline. They also have less CO2 responsiveness, and they're not having the violent wake-ups during sleep that the younger cohorts have. So, so what's the, how does this affect our treatment? So in which therapy should we use to address airway collapsibility and neuromuscular decline? Well, CPAP is still the treatment of choice for moderate severe sleep apnea in older adults. CPAP has similar adherence rates in older adults compared to younger adults. Its best adherence is seen in older adults with more severe disorder. And older, older adults who adhere to CPAP realize similar benefits, reduce snoring, reduce sleepiness although the cardiovascular improvement is unclear. In CPAP adherence, patients show a significant improvement in tests of mental agility and memory. So that's the main thing. We're probably helping their quality of life a lot with uh, mental agility and memory. And there's reduced need for daytime napping and reduced nap duration. When the patients, older, oh, thank you. When older patients do struggle with um, CPAP, we have to, I think of them a little bit differently. I, I want cost-effective treatments. I want minimally invasive treatments. I want things of low morbidity with rapid recovery. And I really want, because I know that their mortality is not at risk as much, I really don't want to do things that are going to cause them a lot of pain and recovery. So the severity of the disease should not, the cure should not be worse than the severity of disease. And, and we really want to address their outcomes of interest, which is snoring level, daytime sleepiness, and sleep quality. 
I think now we have a grab bag of different things that we can use in older adults with sleep disorder breathing that may actually be fairly minimally invasive but actually quite helpful to their quality of life and sleep quality. There's things like Latera for nasal valve collapsibility, soft palate collapsibility, we can use tissue stiffening procedures, oropharyngeal collapsibility, that's an area of interest of mine that we're still developing, I'll talk about in a minute. Hypopharyngeal collapsibility, uh, uh, we can do static procedures such as higher myotomy suspension, oropharynx and hypopharynx collapsibility, oral appliance can be helpful, or uh, upper airway stimulation therapy if you want a dynamic treatment. So soft palate collapsibility. So there's a lot of ways to stiffen the palate. I frankly use all of these uh, at various times in my career. But this is what I found. I've read everything on snoring. And I'm going to sum it up to you in this one slide. No single technique will <laughs> cure snoring. All, all actually, though, can reduce snoring volume by 30 to 50 percent based on bed partner visual analog scale. So that's what I tell patients. I go, we're going to manage your snoring. We're going to reduce it. We're going to try to make your spouse happy. They can all reduce daytime sleepiness by 30 to 50 percent based on Epworth. All show a trend towards reduced effectiveness over time with the best effectiveness being about two years. So this is often something that needs to be repeated. Scar tissue softens with time. All these things cause minimum levels of pain, not requiring narcotics. That's good. All are safe with few complications, uh, device extrusion being a main one or tissue ulceration. And all can be used for first line option for snoring, upper airway resistance syndrome, or mild OSA. And all can be combined with multi-level procedures such as nasal surgery or basic song radio frequency or oral appliance to further reduce snoring and improve treatment outcomes. So here's my summary of all the different things that I've used. Um, and they vary in evidence from good evidence to kind of limited evidence. And you can see that they, uh, kind of the new thing is eveloplasty. Pillar's kind of been put on hold recently. It's kind of in company no man land. Uh, but I still think it's a decent procedure if somebody uh, takes on that, uh, some corporation wants to buy that uh, device. But basically they differ mainly in this, which is price. You can see this price points of what it costs you in your office to offer these. And because of this, I've been using much more of this barb suture. Let me show you that. So this is what I do in the office. I take a $30 barb suture, and I do a little W-plasty to the soft palate. So it's a double arm suture. I throw one throw across kind of the mid palate. I then go in the same hole down near the uvula, and then I go in that same hole up and out, creating this W. And I charge my patients 300 bucks for that. So it's a $30 suture, it's 300 bucks, it takes me five minutes to do. But actually I tell them it's a resorbable suture. I go, we're gonna test this concept, that's affordable price. We're gonna see if stiffening your palate actually makes it better. If it does, maybe we'll move on to something more complex, more expensive. Here, here's the procedure kind of sped up in time, but you can see it's pretty easy to do. Just kind of, and the patient's comfortable. We sprayed them down with a little Pontacane and injected two or three cc's of local. And you're just kind of doing your little W-plasty in the soft palate. It actually does create compression with your barb suture and a bit of lift as well. And that's what you're trying, the things like eveloplasty and fancier things are trying to do. Um, but it's similar and it's cheap. And that's why I like it. I mean, Memphis is not Palo Alto. We don't you know, you might occasionally see a Tesla on the road in Memphis, but not too often. So we still like our fossil fuels here. But um, tongue, tongue stiffening certainly is something that I've been doing for a long time. Radio frequency can help with that. It's easy to do. You can do it in the office under local anesthesia. I typically will do two puncture holes, and with each puncture hole, do three treatments. And so six total lesions per treatment. And you can see after two or three treatments, you start to get remodeling of the tongue. It does have some modest effects on snoring and people who don't have massive tongues. These are people, again, with at most mild sleep apnea. How about oropharynx soft tissue advance? Well, this is, these are the things that we've been doing expansion of pharyngoplasty for, for years, but can we do it less painfully? And these are things that we're studying now. This is what's called the pharyngosling. It's a device by Cook. It's a bioresorbable 
uh, material bio design. You might have used it for head and neck surgery or uh, nasal surgery or otologic surgery, but we're using it now as a suspension, kind of suspending this off the pterygoid hamulus. But I can tell you this, we're hoping to achieve a lot of the results of expansion pharyngoplasty through some small incisions with a lot less pain. And that's really the goal. So stay tuned, that's still under development. How about uh, hypopharynx soft tissue advancement? Well, I actually am somewhat of a fan of the you know, hyoid suspension in the right um, selected patients. We do know that patients with sleep disorder breathing have elongated upper airway segments that creates a longer segment of collapsibility due to low placement of the hyoid bone. And, and really what I think the hyoid suspension is working on is this hyoepiglottic area, this retroepiglottic airway. So the patients that I think about using, here, here's an example of a patient with collapse of that retroepiglottic airway on dice. So while I'm actually doing dice, I will actually tug on their hyoid. You'll see I'm tugging on the hyoid to see if it, I can actually increase their retroepiglottic airway. I'm going to release it. You can see I released it right there and you get collapse. So this procedure is actually first described here at Stanford by Riley and Powell. At the time they described it as a, um, hyo, um, a thyrohyoid apexy and they, they, the initial results look quite promising. However, I never found much success with this and, and I found that when I did it, I was actually not changing the position of the hyoid bone, I was lifting the larynx. So uh, I don't know if I was really doing much of anything to the hypoglottic airway. So, um, so really what I think we're trying to do is get a hyomandibular suspension to create that retroepiglottic airway and enlarge it. So and this shows us on, this is Mike Abaddon who's done a lot of work on this shows what it can do. You can see the airway here. Here's the hyoid bone. And you get a, almost doubling in the size of this airway lumen in that retroepiglottic segment by pulling that hyoid bone forward. So this is the one group of patients. If you look at a series of dice, about 20% of sleep apnea patients have collapse of that retroepiglottic airway. And that's what we're trying to expand in that group of patients. So we did look at a group of patients who had only higher myotomy and suspension as a sole treatment and or nasal surgery. So some of these patients did have nasal surgery, but we know that that doesn't affect HI much. So these were patients with just higher myotomy and suspension um, or uh, higher myotomy and suspension with nasal surgery. And we found that it actually had pretty good results. We had surgical success in 47% of patients. These were patients who were selected based on epiglottic collapse. And finally, HI of less than 10 and 42% of patients, so not, not too bad for a single surgery. And, and this is a low morbidity surgery. We're not, and this is one I don't hesitate doing on an older person because we're not really cutting out tissue. The recovery time can be quite rapid. The main complaint they have is some, some mental edema, which can be worked out with massage and some steroid cream. So also actually has a code, uh, that code that's quite good for facilities. Um, uh, for sleep surgery. So, uh, there, obviously, oral appliance are going to advance both the oropharynx and the hypopharynx, and it's an important part of a treatment paradigm. Uh, I, I work very closely with some sleep dentists that are very good, and I find it's a very important part of our uh, sleep treatment. And we do like to often do this under um, DICE examination due to some of that data that shows that we get better outcomes with DICE. So, um, you can see here's a patient with collapse both the tongue and epiglottis on dice. And we've had, we've preformed some bite, uh, uh, bite uh, offsets or uh, molds that we then try on during the dice to see which one opens the airway the most. And, and some of that can change based on the vertical height and also the anterior advancement. So let me just, fix it. but I'll, I'll kind of show you once we've, once we've selected the best outcome, you can see we actually are supporting the airway quite well. We have real-time validation that this is likely going to be effective therapy. So how about oropharynx and hypopharynx collapse due to neuromuscular? This is really where Inspire comes in. It's a dynamic 
opening of the airway. Um, and, and what we have found that we can actually really get that airway open by getting this, capturing these um, nerve branches that go to the genia glossus muscle, but also actually, this is an earlier diagram, capturing this branch that goes to the genio hyoid to get a lot of that effect that we're looking for with hyoid suspension. And here's, here's examination of the effect of that on the hypopharyngeal airway. You can see during stimulation, you get massive. That's also putting stretch on that lateral hypopharyngeal wall that can give you collapse. So pretty impressive. So um, I'm going to flip through some of this. The point here, though, is that the group that's going to benefit the most is actually our older patients, yep. and they're the ones with the neuromuscular collapse. So this is a recent study that came out comparing younger with older patients who underwent upper airway stimulation. <coughs> the older adults greater than 65 years had a 30% better response of HI and greater normalization of upward scale scores and higher nightly usage rates compared to younger cohorts. And it's probably based on that self-selection of patients having a different uh, morphology of or pathophysiology as they age. So in conclusion, sleep surgery outcomes will improve with better patient phenotyping. Older patients with OSA, including snoring, may have a unique phenotype characterized by both uh, increased tissue collapsibility and neuromuscular decline. Newer surgical techniques can address these underlying issues for older patients with less morbidity. And I think the outcomes that a lot of these patients are going for go beyond HI, include snoring, sleepiness, function, and memory and concentration. So I'll stop there for any questions people may have at this point. So thank you. That is excellent.